Hello, I am Simulator Dirk, and welcome back to UK Truck Simulator. We are at our main base here in Sheffield. And you may notice, if you remember the end of the last episode, you may notice something actually different. I have a different truck and a different trailer combination here. We had an MAN end of the last episode then I decided off camera that I wasn't happy with it because I didn't have anything on the main chassis so it was empty where the first uh, where the first Pepsi truck or first part of the Pepsi truck is the trailer on the main or the um, container on the main chassis that wasn't there before so, uh, so I've added that. Also, I've added this is an indigenous skin um, based on Australia that I've used in the Middle East and European series. So I was able to apply it to this Scania as well. And then on the back, we've also got another Pepsi trailer there. Um, it's been a bit of a running theme um, not only in truck simulator but also my um occasionally with bus simulator and also um my law enforcement ones using gta um where sometimes i've seen a pepsi truck or whatever um the ironic thing is i don't actually drink as much pepsi as i used to but um anyway it is about 11 30 in the morning we'll say good morning to skynet But, in a way, we can't say good morning to Skynet because we actually don't have a job yet. So, we'll rectify that now. So, job market, cargo market, we're in Sheffield. So, ironically, in the beverage section... We don't have any like Pepsi or a soft drink product that we can remain in the UK. Having said that, I think the hang on, how is that in? Oh, yeah. Oh, the map the map says that's in the Netherlands. Um and I've been to Manchester already. That's only a very short one I would have thought from Sheffield to Hull, but obviously not. Aberdeen That's yeah, decent trip to Aberdeen, so let's take that. The TNT in Sheffield. Time to hit the road. Time to hit the road, Skynet. It's raining. And uh, we have our... I always have trouble in... Whoops, where did I go? There we go. It's raining, so lights on. So, 11, just before lunchtime on Wednesday, we've got to go over to TNT to pick up the load. Never mind. I'll find a new route. Hang on, Skynet, we're just getting out of here. Whoops, no, I don't need to hit reverse just yet. This is really weird because the sun's clearly out, but it's also clearly raining. And 
then turn left. Turn left. Turn left. Fine. <laughs> we drove five seconds down the road, Skynet. Job offer, cargo market. That's the one we want. 31 tonnes of milk. It doesn't have the same ring it, so it is 70,000 tonnes of metal. Ah, uh, we're gonna just load it. Let's go. Okay, let's find a new route. Okie dokie, cargo has been loaded, so we'll have a look at our stats. 31 tonnes of milk to Aberdeen. We're ex our window is a very narrow window on Thursday morning. Um, 22 hours of the window. Next rest stop in 10 hours and 43 minutes. Actually, looking at that, 10 hours 43 rest stop. We can do that in 10 hours and 21 minutes if we don't have any diversions or anything like that. So we may be able to do this complete job without having a rest stop. Turn Thank you, Skynet. Uh, our trail is following us. Good. So apart from changing the MAN for a Scania and redoing the Scania, um, I haven't done anything else in terms of the depots, other trucks. Compared to the last episode, I'll debate in a moment if I should actually move over to the um, the inside lane. This reminds me of very early in my um, truck simulator career. And maybe this is the way that it is in real life, but you basically got zero breakdown lane to contend with. This could be the way it could be in real life. So, in case you haven't seen truck simulators in company mode, where I own trucks. Alrighty, we're heading towards Turn left. Newcastle and Manchester, heading towards the Great North. Um, Um, so now that I am doing jobs for myself rather than doing quick jobs and I own trucks etc or in, in the, this case truck um, anything that was getting paid by the other company before say fuel infringements um, tolls, that sort of thing. Um, maintenance is now getting paid by me. I do have thirty, um, sorry, eighty-five million pounds 
in the bank thanks to Wemod. Now my theory on that, for anyone who hasn't heard it, is that, you know, I've got 144 hours up at the moment at the time of recording just on Euro Truck. That's not including also what I've got on American Truck. And if it was, you know, if you were grinding the way that you have to grind to be able to afford to have your own truck, I probably would have given up long ago. Whereas if I make an, I don't know everything about trucks. If I make an error in a truck selection like I did on the last episode. Keep right and then continue straight on. Thank you Skynet. Um, like it's no big deal. Go straight on. Because I've got money in reserve so I can sell that truck and buy another truck and not just buy the one truck because that's the only truck I can afford. I thought that was going to happen, so I just backed off. So it's actually, so it's actually prolonged my playing and my enjoyment and being able to do different things that I'd, I wouldn't be able to do normally. Um, I feel the same way about mods. This map would be totally different um, if it wasn't a modded map, it's by Pro Mods. Um, the various trucks I wouldn't have access to if I was just using vanilla trucks. And also the, you know, things, things like weather conditions all the environment factors if I just left them stock standard vanilla the, it would be a, a very very um, different experience and if I think about all the uh, maps that I've driven on in truck simulator and I haven't driven on on others that are that are out there but I haven't got into yet if I think about the Middle East map, a lot of the Europe map, um, when I managed to get into Canada and Mexico off the American map, and of course the Australian and Japanese maps, I wouldn't be able to do that if I was um, using vanilla maps. And mostly the mods have been okay. You know, it is using an aging base. I know there's been a lot of improvements to the base or the vanilla map since things got started. But you're using things that are hardwired in. You know, especially with um, chassis and whatnot, um, truck dealers and all that sort of thing.
So a rainy day, it's uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, we're expected just before 11. So if we just have a nice run for a change, no problems with accidents or anything, that'd be nice. <laughs> I like that. The North. And so another thing about not doing quick jobs over using the freight or cargo markets is that I go to a destination today I go to a destination today in this case Aberdeen I go to Aberdeen and then on the next job I basically choose um, somewhere another job preferably out of Aberdeen to go somewhere else now at the end of this job I will almost be out of hours for today and then I'll have to have a rest somewhere and then after my after my rest work out where I'm going to go next depending on what's available at the time but what I've noticed in quick job mode let's say I'll go to Aberdeen today finish this job and then pick another one it will reset my fatigue meter as if I'd never done anything Whereas I actually like the challenge of, okay, I'm at Aberdeen, um, I've got no hours, I need to find somewhere to rest, let's rest, and then pick a job that's available in the morning. Now, in the real world, in a big trucking company, that's all done for me. But here, obviously, I have to talk myself. So fuel shouldn't be an issue. We should make it on fatigue. You know, we're coping with the weather. Decision time is it Skynet? No. So we're heading up into Scotland. This is the uh, Newcastle exit. Shout out to my fellow Novocastrians, both in Australia and in England. Um, having lived in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia for approaching four years, 
it'll probably be four years by the time you're watching this. Um, there's a bit of an informal debate and your mileage varies between people. When uh, or when can people be considered a local? Like a, like a local Novocastrian or a Novo as some people call it. You know, when people say, where are you from? Well, originally I'm not from here. I'm from Western Sydney and that will always be the case. But I could also choose, depending on the context of where are you from, um, okay. Um, depending on the context now, I'll just say, oh, I'm from Newcastle. exit left um, so the question is you know when are you considered local now in the eyes of many people who are born and bred in Newcastle exit left. the only locals are people who are born and bred here um, you get some people that are born and bred here and then they go somewhere else and they come back So they'd be considered local when they come back. Someone like me who's been here for four years, you know, I consider myself a local now. You know, the only reason that I go to Sydney is because of the day job. Do they have Texaco in the UK? Um, yeah, the only reason that I go to Sydney now is because of the day job. And if I didn't have to go, like I didn't have to go for months when we're under, co under COVID restrictions, um, I wasn't allowed to go to Sydney for, for work purposes. I can only go as far as the central coast. Um, in terms of not going to Sydney, that was great. But everything I need and everything I want can be done in this Newcastle, Hunter, Lake Macquarie area. I shop locally the majority of the time. I do get some things online, but the majority of the time I shop locally. And even if it's at a at a chain store, like a big, you know, one of the big two in the supermarkets or whatever, that's still still local. So it's an it's an interesting discussion, but one of our local radio stations up here, um, part of their advertising is local ads, and occasionally, if they're doing a flashback or something, they'll say, "Oh, well, if you remember doing such and such and such and such and such and such as a kid, well, you're local as." And then there's other things that they say, oh, do you remember, you know, Marathon Stadium, which is where the Newcastle Knights play in the NRL? Yeah, I remember. Oh, we're into Scotland now. We're going this way. Okay. Didn't think we'd be going this way. So we're now in Scotland. Um, 
You know, do you remember Marathon Stadium? Yeah, I've been to Marathon Stadium when it was Marathon Stadium. It's had a few name changes over the years with um, sponsorship and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I remember Marathon Stadium. You know, I remember the giant tower at um, Queen's Wharf that had um, various nicknames and various connotations in relation to the shape of it. Um, I wasn't a local. I wasn't a local then, and I wasn't a local um, when I went to Marathon Stadium either. So, just talking football for a minute. Um, or rugby league more specifically. When I grew up, when I was growing up, I lived in Western Sydney and I lived in Penrith and um, Penrith, the Penrith Panthers, they were my local team. So you went primarily for your local team. So I did and during the times I supported them and supported them actively and went to games and things like that. You know, they might make semi-finals occasionally. They did win a couple of premierships there. 1991 being most memorable. You know, narrowly missed out in 1990 and then won in 91. And then the Super League war happened um, Penrith went over to Super League, it was 97 Penrith went over to Super League uh, that's roughly when I f also started following Newcastle because they went the other way to the Australian Rugby League and then in 2001 I went to the grand final, and I think it's the only grand final I've been to at what was then the Olympic Stadium, and it had the nosebleed section, and it was 110,000 people there, and I was sitting way up in the nosebleed section, and I remember the Knights had a really great first half, and Parramatta forgot to turn up. And it was something like 24 nil at half time. Newcastle went on to win easily. You know, and I've always liked, and I've always liked the Newcastle area. Uh, my first time here was probably around 1997. I remember um, becoming an adult, if you get my drift, in the bedroom department, if you get my drift, in Newcastle. Um, but I remember this grand final and thinking, oh, this is, you know, it's going to be so great for Newcastle. They've had struggles over the years. Um, first premiership after coming into the league in 1990, sorry, 1988. They had the earthquake in 89, they had BHP leaving. And football's been, rugby league's been really good for the town. So that was in 1997, when they won their first one in the ARL, and then 2001, when everything had uh, reunified when they beat Parramatta and I was thinking of actually coming back to Newcastle thank you Skynet and, in, and joining in in the celebration but in some ways that wasn't my celebration to, to be a part of <clears throat> and also Logistically, I thought, okay, well, it's late at night when I'd be um, 
minor accident there. Um, it'd be really late by the time I actually arrived in Newcastle. Then it would be early hours of the morning when I got there, then the celebration, and then I'd have to get back. And anyone who's ever travelled from Sydney to Newcastle knows that you're doing that for between two and three hours in each direction, depending on how you get there and when you get there. And then I thought, you know what, it's um, it's time to time for me to go home. So I went home. You know, watched all the celebrations on TV and everything like that. Um, so there we there we were. Now in in the meantime, oh, this isn't looking good. So I'll just hang back a bit and see what's going on. Um, now there's a women's competition in the um, National Rugby League, the NRLW, and Newcastle have won um, two consecutive premierships, and they're the defending premiers in the um, NRLW, National Rugby League Women's, they're the defending champions. So in the background, 2023 was a bit of a uh, bit of a difference, but for a lot of the other years, um, the men's team have gone downhill compared to the years of 2021. Uh-oh. Look, look at this Skynet. Oh, he's letting me in. Thank you. Oh, uh, well, well, we don't want to do what we did last time, do we? Even though he should be well and truly forward of this. Sure, have one guy there with the flashing lights on, maybe, but have somebody else actually blocking the exit. Or we'll have what we had last time. So Skynet's going to have to come up with another solution. We've still got three and a half hours to go in the trip. You should be able to do that quite easily. Um, 35 k's to Glasgow. So for many years the men's team have underperformed and then the women's team in the first year in the competition now it's a bit com more complicated with the women's competition because uh, one of the years they had two seasons in the one calendar year because of COVID. Um, in the first year that Newcastle were in the women's competition they come stone motherless last, and if I remember, they didn't win a game. The next year, they got they got better, and they got some different players as well. And they um, won the competition for the for the next two seasons. So I remember I watched. Oy, um, I watched the grand final on TV and then they won the competition. They had um, gatherings at the local club nearby when they got back from Sydney, but they actually had a civic reception for the team on the Tuesday afternoon and they were given they were given the keys to the city um, and there was a big celebration in the um, at the town hall on 
I'm not liking the look of this either. Um, and I went to that and there was so many people there. It was amazing. But I'd also not heavily followed rugby league as much as I did after I went to America for the first time in 2019. Yep, yeah, quite good. Uh, sorry, not 2019. Tw 2009. Um, I'd actually spent a lot of the um, rugby league season in America because I took three months off work and I went to America for three months, travelling all around the countryside. And then it was in, you know, it was starting to be in the really professional era. Whereas when I was growing up, you know, guys had day jobs, that sort of thing, and it was a different... Oh, here we go. Why am I, so, why am I sleeping now? I've still got lots of time to go on my fatigue meter, I would have thought. We did have that diversion. Whoops. Oh, we got... Oh. Okay, we've got our next rest break in 90 minutes. We're still almost four hours away. So we did lose time. Um, we did lose time because of that diversion. So what I might do, just the next rest area we see, um, I may pull up. Because it was touch and go to start with, with the needing a rest, but now it's definitely not achievable. So we'll see a service centre, or services as they call it in the UK. I'll, um, I'll pull over and have a sleep. Because it's not as touch and go as it was when I uh, left Sheffield. So I fell out of love with Rugby League. Um, so that was 2009. So I'm mainly stuck to watching cricket, supercars, and uh, we've got some traffic up ahead. Oh, we've got some road work, okay. We're going to have to um, move over here. Oh, they're letting me in, thank you. And I really like this. Uh, this wasn't a thing when I first started playing in 2016. But now, my biggest sport of choice is ice hockey. You are getting tired, I know. Well, and I think back to rugby league and things that were totally acceptable in rugby league when I was growing up. You know, and it wasn't the, you know, the big bash of the, you know, 60s, 70s and, and that sort of thing. But you could still get away with a lot, a lot more back then than you can now. Um, for instance, the good old shoulder charge. You know, shoulder charges were, were common, even if, You know, back then, you could do a shoulder charge on a guy. It wouldn't hit them in the head. And so, therefore, that's sweet. Now, if you hit somebody in the head as a part of the shoulder charge, well, that wouldn't be so good. 
But now, in current day rugby league in the NRL, you can't shoulder charge people anymore. That's a penalty. But, you know, I reflected on the way things were in relation to um, watching and listening to games back then in the 80s and 90s. There'd be a... I'll talk radio first. On a Saturday afternoon, there'd be, the, there'd be a game that'd be on the radio. And on Sunday afternoon, there'd be a game on the radio. On the Sunday afternoon games, for all the other games, they had reporters that were around the grounds and giving score updates and whatnot. And that would be it. And then you'd read the newspapers and you'd see what the around the grounds people, because they'd often writing for newspapers, what they thought of the game the next day. Oh, there's a um, services coming up in uh, just under a mile. So I'll pull over and I have my sleep. And for TV. There was one match on the Saturday afternoon that was on the ABC. And then you'd have a Sunday night, what would be a Sunday night game on the TV. Um, but it would be, um, I'm not gonna, pa oh. I did that really badly, didn't I? Um, have I got another spot? Finding a new route. I'll stop the engine. We'll get some fuel while we're here. Oh, it's knocked me off. I've overshot the... the I'm going to have to keep going. I've overshot the... I was expecting the rest area to be after the... Um, after the Bowsers. So we're going to have to go to the next one. Um, so the Sunday game, the Sunday night television game, and there'd only be the one, was not live, and it was after the news on Sunday night. Yes or no? Keep left and then exit left. So during the news on the sport, they'd say, if you don't know, if you don't want to know the um, result of the score that's coming up, um, look away now. But then again, you compare it to um, the way things are now. In Australia, you've got Thursday night matches, you've got Friday night matches. There's more teams in the competition, admittedly. Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night. Sometimes there's a Monday game instead of a Thursday game. And potentially, if you had paid TV, subscription TV, you can watch every game live. And if you missed a game, you can go back and watch it on replay. You know, there's live... You know, the... Go straight on. About three games a week live on Fruit Air TV. But to get the most of it, you really need pay TV and a lot of it, and that's... 
one of the reasons the Super League war started. You've got a, every year the um, the exposure and you know the technology continues to improve and you know being able to feel like at times you're on the field and that's the way that sport generally not just rugby league has improved with their um, coverage of sport you know the same thing with the cricket uh, for international matches here in Australia they wanted to encourage people who were living in the city where the game was being played so Sydney, I'll use Sydney as the example. They wanted people to go out to the go out to the games. So if the test match was in Sydney, the only session that you'd see would be the the session after you know after the tea break. So from about three o'clock to six o'clock. And if it was a D-night one day international, which is the only one that I had when we were kids, um, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, you'd have, you'd be watching basically the first 15 overs between 2.30 and 4.30. And in both cases, there'd be highlight packages late at night after the game had finished. Now, oops. Now they have um, now they have live games all the time on you know even, and even on um, even on free to air TV they've dropped that um, they've dropped those restrictions. You know, T20 cricket's taken over. And there's a lot of cricket on now when you consider test matches, the T20s internationally and one day internationals. And then also you've got the uh, domestic Big Bash League as well. There's so much cricket on that by the time that they come up to this summer, the One Day Internationals between Australia and the West Indies, hardly anyone went. They knew that watching on TV, there's a lot more sport on TV these days. Um, you know, it's expensive to go to live sport. You are getting sleepy. So it's coming up to 1am. Um, I haven't seen a rest stop since the one that we pulled into, but we were, but I overshot it because I didn't know where the rest area was. In these truck simulators, you only can pull up in the um, designated rest areas. You just can't find a quiet section here and then just go to sleep. So we've got 40 kilometres to go, 42 minutes. Um, 13 miles according to the sign we just passed for Aberdeen itself. So I'm in the interesting situation where, if, okay, I just got knocked off again, 138 pounds. With 30 minutes to go, do I just keep going? Oh! I haven't had that happen for ages. So we must be coming up to Aberdeen soon. 
so we've got 17 minutes left then we've got unloading here's Aberdeen Aberdeen discovered all right Skynet where do we go So now it would be pretty pointless pulling over somewhere with the load on. Oi! Now what was interesting about that... As soon as I saw Daisy coming up on the screen... I really demolished that roundabout, didn't I? Um, when it came dozing on the screen, I braked. It was still, I was still accelerating according to the um, to the sound effects. Tired. Yes, I know. But that's what happens when you... Oh, here we go. Now I'm totally stopped. Had a snooze at the lights. It's been ages since I got to this point. Okay, breaking, breaking, breaking. Go straight on. Did you take me the best way, Skynet? I wonder. We're six minutes away. Get ready to turn right. Turn right. Oh, there's a rest area over there. I can't even see the little icon on the map yet.
Ah, uh, there it is. It's alright, Skynet, we're here. Alright, so milk delivered from Sheffield to Aberdeen, 842 kilometres, 14 hours and 4 minutes. I was well over um, my, fatigue my fatigue limit there. Proficiency, long distance and urgent delivery bonuses. We will continue. Now, where have they parked me in relation to anything? Okay. Now, realistically, I'd be able to sleep here. But, because this is because this is truck simulator, I can't rest here, but fortunately for me, yes I know, avoid sleeping defence, I think that's the third time I got knocked off. Fortunately for me, we did see a rest area just up here. You are getting tired. You are getting tired? I've dozed off a few times and I had a crash. There's no you are getting tired about it. Our fatigue meter doesn't reset once we made that delivery. And because there was unloading time, we're even tireder. So we have our parking area up here. Ah, breaking, 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 breaking. I've hit this pole. Now, of course, in the real world, I wouldn't be able to know, potentially, when I was asleep. So, what happened would be realistic in terms of you don't know when you're going to doze so you can't apply the brake but I was applying the brake you are getting sleepy yes I know Oh, did I get my truck stuck? Stuck? Yep. So what I should possibly do at this point, well we're not going to repair the truck now, but we will when we wake up. Stop, 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 stop. Oh no.
I want to park that somewhat realistically in terms of... I don't want to park it right there. Alright, you are getting some rest, finally. It's 11.26 in the morning. We don't have a load. First thing I'll be doing is um, getting the truck repaired. I've been Simeon Dirk, you've been wonderful. Thank you very much for watching. Whoops, wrong one. Thank you very much for watching, and if I can, because I want to get, thank you very much for watching, uh, we will see you next time on UK Truck Simulator, thanks for watching, and goodbye for now.